Hello there and welcome back to the Libertarian Listener with me, Chris Wilkinson. In today's episode, I'm joined by the leader of the Hampshire Libertarians, Scott Neville. How are you doing today? Hello, thank you for inviting me. I'm doing very well, thank you. Excellent. Scott is one of the co-presenters of Freedom Report UK and I'll provide a link to that in the description below. Listeners may be very interested to know that Sir Richard Branson has found his £500 million by selling a stake in Virgin Galactic, proving that he didn't need a taxpayer-funded bailout after all. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people in Staffordshire that are getting fed up with the Thursday NHS clapping ritual. What's the turnout like in Hampshire? Uh, The turnout, I would say, is about 50-50. I'd say half the the houses round round here do it and half don't. But it does vary from place to place. Some roads it's really, really popular and some roads it's it's not popular at all. It is strange sort of how you see the breakdown, but it's something I just find weird and I I just don't get, if I'm honest. Mm. What are your thoughts on the £2 billion package for walking and cycling schemes? Is it a waste of money? Probably. I mean, could cycling and walking be improved? Pretty much, yes. Could anything be improved? Insert blank here. Could it be improved? Yes, it probably could. And there's certain things where I think cycling or encouraging cycling is a, is a really positive thing. So if you look at our town centres now, a lot of them are gridlocked. And it's been a policy that I pushed for a long, long time is we should remove VAT from bikes because they're a very good way at keeping people fit. And it reduces the traffic and nonsense going around town centres. Because at the end of the day, the parking and whatnot, people that are disabled, we should be trying to make it a little bit easier for them where possible. But two billion pounds for walking and cycling right now for the probably short term is just a bit crazy. And given what they're trying to replace with it, they're essentially trying to replace public transport. So with walking and cycling, they're not replacing public transport. They're replacing a subset of public transport because no one in Basingstoke, which is about an hour's train ride from London, if I get on a train, rush hour in the morning at Basingstoke, it'll have 12 carriages thousands of seats there will not be a seat free there is that many people that commute from Basingstoke to London every day for work so the idea that you could essentially cycle 40 50 miles into the center of London on a bike each and every day 50 miles in 50 miles back is ludicrous Mm. so it's not replacing the rail network in any way it is replacing the bus network and two billion pounds to replace that Without lots of shops being open for people to be able to go out and buy bikes to begin with. And if you look at the number of people that take the bus to work anyway, I think it's a bit of it's it's a bit of a pipe dream. I don't think there's that many people that take the bus to work really, where you could credibly replace it by walking and cycling. Even if you could, we're looking at something that needs to be done now in the next couple of weeks. You cannot possibly spend two billion pounds on infrastructure improvements in a couple of weeks. I mean, Mm. uh, the the procurement processes that the public sector go through couldn't even spend that kind of money probably in a year, even if they wanted to, because all of the accountability and the the other processes, which are very, very bureaucratic, that the public sector has to go through to spend money, it's just not possible to spend it in that time frame. And it's only for a very small percentage of people so yeah, I, th- I find it's I find yeah it's it's way too much money. It's not a credible timescale to spend that much money. And even if it was, there is no supporting infrastructure for the construction industry, for the industry that builds like traffic lights and the cycle storage facilities. There's no support for them to be able to turn this two billion into something which can actually be used to improve cycling in the timescale that's necessary. The big story of this week is obviously the changing government strategy, or the U-turn. So the government has finally realised in the wake of increasing business bankruptcies, redundancies and soaring debt levels that shutting down the economy to stop most people from getting a mild cough is doing more harm than good. And in a broadcast on Sunday evening, the Prime Minister performed the first humiliating stage in the U-turn I predicted a few weeks ago. The ending of the lockdown will be linked to the reproduction rate of the virus. Now, surely it's a very good thing that they've finally got a plan in place to bring about the end of the lockdown. What's your initial reaction to the announcement? Yeah, it's hard to say, really. It's a bit... 
let's take the different parts of it. There's the way he presented himself and the, the information that he actually gave out. And then there's the substance of the argument. Boris Johnson seems to be a bit of a wally, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm not going to lie about that. He, he sort of visions himself as, you know, this, this modern day Churchill with his wonderful speeches and him rousing the nation and all of this sort of Churchillian wartime spirit that he's trying to conjure up. But all he's doing is he's taking essentially some very simple ideas waffling around them a lot making them more confusing than they need to be and looking like a wally it feels to me like he's enjoying this crisis too much because it's giving him a chance to act in this sort of churchillian manner that he wants to the second thing is yeah i'm surprised it took this long i mean realistically mm. if businesses and if employers can keep people safe and obviously we sh you know we shouldn't be encouraging this virus i i accept that you know there is a risk posed from this virus it's not nothing and people are scared of it and and certain people that have got lots of health conditions should be very scared of it but to do what we've done and, and shut the economy down like this which is you know increase the number of suicides it's uh increased the rate of domestic violence there is vastly more people unemployed it's not healthy for society for loads of people to suddenly become unemployed because it's not going to be that easy for them to get back in the job market and, it, and if you think about it there's a thousand more people in your industry say that's suddenly cropped up in your area that have got your skill set um that are looking for jobs then there's only a finite number of those jobs they're not all going to come back and be switched on on day one because businesses have spent their disposable income on surviving the lockdown because they've still got rents to pay. They've still got electricity bills and other type of bills. You know, the security lights just don't turn off because there's a lockdown. The bills from Chubb, who manage the security systems, just don't go away. The bills from Southern Electric or whoever provides the gas and electricity, the water, the internet, the council tax if they're in a residence or the business rates, none of that just goes away. So all of, all of that still has to be paid for. So any spare capital that they had isn't going to be going into to giving people their jobs back straight away. So that's going to leave a lot more people unemployed, which means there's going to be a lot more people competing for the same jobs, which is inevitably going to cause a reduction in the wages for these people. Mm. Because that's the only, you know, what that is the logical response. If you've got too many people applying for a job and they're all perfectly qualified, why wouldn't you pay them a bit less? I mean, it makes perfectly good business sense to, to do that. So that's going to have to be a long term consequence because obviously the people that are unemployed or have been put out of work, they still have their mortgage to pay. You know, they have the same bills that the businesses have really so they're, they're going to struggle and you know you're going to see kids that are going through school now forgetting for a moment that some of them have had their chances of taking exams which might change their life destroyed um forgetting about that for a second they might be going back to a situation where they're you know they're being slightly less well fed there's visible stress at home because the parents are struggling so yeah it's got huge ramifications uh, for all of society and then yeah there is as, a, as a, i just hinted at the whole idea that you know you've just written off this generation which now isn't going to take exams and if i look, use my own life as an example when i went through the school system a very very long time ago <laughs> i was predicted certain grades and i took my exams and i got better grades now obviously it's good that they're doing something to help these people that are not going to take exams in that they're giving them the predicted grades but if i was given my predicted grades they would wouldn't have been the grades that I actually achieved. Mm, so that would yeah. have then mean that I would have gone to college with lower grades. That would have probably been fine, to be honest. But when it came to sort of applying for university, the whole UCAS points system, I would have been stitched up then because I wouldn't have had the grades needed to go and get the entry points I needed for my degree. So it is quite possible that this seemingly, you know, we're just going to have, you know, like an eight week holiday off school and cancel exams. It, it might seem like it's a minor thing, but it's going to have huge ramifications for some of these kids, which, you know, they, they're going to have part of their life royally stitched up as a result of this. I know that that shouldn't happen, but I, I like to think that I'm wise enough to know how the world works. That These systems shouldn't be rigid and they should be able to take account of the fact this has happened. But I know that the world doesn't work like that. These systems are rigid and they will not properly take into account what's happened so yeah the lasting damage to some of these kids is, is awful and it's one of these things that you know very few people are talking about even at the other end of the spectrum i'm expecting the pension age to have to rise 
as a result of this. So people that think they're going to be retiring in the next five years, well, I, I think they could be in for a bit of a shock. Yeah. The money that this this has cost us as a country, a public spending deficit was something like £40 billion a year. And now it's already projected to be £250 billion. Mm. That's an incredible increase in spending. And I think last time I looked, the interest on national debt was the third or fourth biggest expenditure of the government. So that's only going to go up. That just means less money for whoever, NHS, schools, pick whichever department you want it for. It's less money for them and more money going on interest for the debt. So we, we get some cool stuff now. But the ramifications going forward of having to pay that back are scary. Mm, absolutely. Moving on to Sturgeon versus Boris. Uh, there's a significant coronavirus policy divergence occurring between England and Scotland. The virus reproduction rate in Scotland is presently estimated to be 0.7 to 1, which is slightly above England's. And I've got a quote from the Daily Mail here. The First Minister said she would ignore the Prime Minister's vague new stay alert to control the virus save lives slogan in favour of the previous stay home message. Sturgeon said that the only change in Scotland was removing a limit on how many times people could take daily exercise. Direct quote here, we do not at this point want to see more businesses opening up, more people going to work. We do not yet want to see more people using public transports and we are not yet changing who can or should be at school, she said. Now, there's one thing that both Nicola Sturgeon and Boris Johnson have in common. They've both missed COBRA meetings. Nicola Sturgeon has missed six of them since January and Boris has missed five. Is it quite dangerous to hear politicians effectively giving people orders on such a scale relating to what they can or can't do with their own lives? Yes, I think that is dangerous. Um, and I think the need to, to sort of create a really simple message is also dangerous because it's making it sort of acceptable that people don't need to think about what they're doing. And I think that's a r really dangerous way to go because there's lots of things in life where if we just think about it for a second, you take a considered view on it, you can make the world a much better place and you can keep yourself safe, you can make yourself happier, you can make make yourself wealthier by just sitting back looking at something reading the small print and thinking about it for a few minutes rather than just having to have a very dull dumbed down message drummed into you you know stay at home protect the nhs save lives i i don't have any examples of it but i can almost imagine you know someone in their garden that's managed to run their foot over with a lawnmower or something and uh, someone sitting in their home going oh no stay at home protect mm. the nhs mm. save lives while this guy's bleeding on his front lawn I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if anything like that happened. But it would be better for them to try and make people very aware of the risk and then encourage them to make a sensible decision based on the risk that was around. So, for example, if someone had a history of depression, say, for example, and they went out for a walk, which involved walking near a railway line, I think it would be very reasonable to go out and keep an eye on them. Mm. particularly if they were showing signs of depression re-emerging in them or that they're struggling with the lockdown or that the the anxiety caused by it is causing them real issues i think in that case you know you should take a considered view stay away from everyone totally get the social distancing thing that makes sense but keep an eye on these people and if you've got elderly parents or one of your parents has, has passed on and you've just got a single parent left who's living on their own. I think it would be a better message to have said, look, you should perhaps consider going to see them. Stand five metres away from them and, and talk to them at the front door. Make sure that they're not feeling isolated and that they're, they're not feeling like this is it, this is the end. But then you, you get what goes on in the shops. And I've seen this myself when I've been shopping. You see people going in with rubber gloves on, face mask on and goggles on over their eyes. And then I've, you know, been in the queue to pay. And the example I saw, this person then lifted the mask off, scratched the side of their mouth with the rubber glove, and then yeah. put the mask back on. And I totally understand why they want to do these things to protect themselves. I'm not saying it's a bad idea even to go to the supermarket and wear gloves. It possibly is a good idea. But to do that and then think, oh, it's okay, I've got an itch, I'll just <laughs> give it a, a scratch and, and get those germs back in under that mask. It beggars belief. And I think part of the problem of having dumbed down simple messages that politicians are drumming in, do this, do that, it's saying people don't have to think. And people that don't think, even if they follow the guidelines, you know, I only went out for shopping, 
you're still doing something dumb. I think the most important thing would be to just have a message where think about what you're doing. Don't just blanket follow X, Y, Z. Think about it first. Moving on to the final topic of today, which is economic meltdown. Now, <laughs> GDP figures for the first quarter are due to be released the day after the recording of this week's episode. From this perspective, the forecast from trading economics is a contraction of 21% on the quarter and 26% on the year. The economy had already experienced a contraction in the second quarter of last year and flatlined in the fourth quarter. Both of those figures were blamed on the Brexit delays. We know it's going to get bad for the economy. How bad do you think it's going to get? Well, for anyone that's interested, I thought about this last night while I was uh, walking home from the shops and I put a, put a post out on my Facebook page. So I've got a Libertarian Party Facebook page and I said, calling it now, budget for next year. Uh, and these are the things that I think are going to happen. Tax-free personal allowance frozen, 1% increase on all levels of income tax, insurance premium tax to rise by 2%, ISA allowance to be dropped to 15,000, alcohol and tobacco duty to rise, 5p a litre added to fuel tax, uh, and VAT to be increased to 22.5%. Um, I think the effect on the economy is going to be bad really bad because people have it in in their mind at the moment and there's still a degree of confidence around this that most businesses are just going to click their fingers and they're going to open back up well the ones that could do that are the ones that haven't closed because the ones that can do that are the ones that can move online at a click of their fingers they're the ones which are in the service industries you know providing bank accounts or insurance or web development or whatever they're very easy to move online they can just change their presence and away they go. So I know a, a couple of small business owners in and around Basingstoke. And they've said to me that, you know, if when the, the government gives the order, it's going to take them, if, if they're lucky, three weeks to get back up and running. That's assuming that they're even there to get back up and running. From my interpretation of the stats on, uh, for example, public houses, pubs, I can certainly see if they're not going to open till July, which is you know, I, I think that's what Boris said is the, the best outcome at the moment is the pubs will reopen in July. Yeah. Well, pubs being shut from sort of for most of February all the way to July. I would say if you've got an independent pub, it, it's gone. It, it's closed now. It's not going to make it because most businesses don't run a surplus, which is enough for them to go while paying their, their standard costs because under employment contract they would still have to pay their their staff they probably still have to pay rent they probably they will definitely still have to pay insurance on their premises they will definitely still have to pay for security on their premises all of that that they still have those costs uh, but they've got you know almost half a year without any income and most businesses don't run in a way where they could just go for half a year without making any income and cover all their costs and everything would be fine so i, I can see that there won't be i i don't honestly think there's going to be this v-shaped recovery that everyone no. talks about i imagine there will be uh, a very quick upturn but it won't be anywhere near back to the levels that we're we're at so let's say if you've got something where the goods don't really perish so let's say you sell stationery for example ryman's the stationer let's pick pick that as an example your goods don't really go off so they can sit in the shop for six ten weeks and probably probably largely okay i think but as soon as they can get their staff back in and the shop's open they can largely just open up and, and carry on but that assumes that the customers that are going to buy from them are, are ready to just come straight back in and buy from them and they're probably not because uh, they either work for these other businesses or or in many cases they're scared you only have to look on facebook pages to see that the level of fear around the virus um and how scared some people are about it i don't think that you know their, their customers are going to all magically come back very very quickly so even if they did open straight away they're not going to return to their previous levels of business so yeah i think it's going to take a very very long time to get the economy back on track to where it was and this is obviously going to have a knock-on effect to people's standards of living and yes yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting economic question really because as far as i understand many recessions are often caused or, or, or made worse by sticky prices which is why inflation is not always a terrible thing there is sometimes some good that comes from inflation because it helps mitigate sticky prices by uh, allowing the value of money to fall and therefore essentially the price indirectly falls by being worth less real stuff so if the prices 
are going to stay the same or people's more, more importantly they're probably going to stay near the same because people expect their wages to stay the same people's costs are probably going to stay the same you know we're not seeing any reduction in council tax or anything like that this is going to have a negative impact on people's standards of living because they're not going to be able to afford as much you know the chances are they're going to be making working less hours because that's the only way that businesses can cut their employment costs without making them redundant and obviously making them redundant if they've got employment rights is is a little bit more challenging there's a process that has to be followed but then there's all the costs associated with it so they're probably not going to make anyone redundant unless they're they're short-term workers and the funniest thing about that is who is the most vulnerable category of worker it's probably the short-term worker the ones that you know the students that are working in tesco's or morrison's or whatever uh, on, a, on a weekend they've only worked their six months to help pay for their way through college or university or whatnot they're probably the most vulnerable and they're going to be the ones first under the bus because they're easy to get rid of because they haven't worked there long enough uh, to get full employment rights my own experience of working for some big companies tells when i was a student tells me that they tend to think um students will stand up for their rights a little bit less anyway so you know that essentially the most vulnerable workers will be the first under the bus when, when when the economy starts to get get going again because people think at the moment it's just going to tick along and then we'll just turn it back on and away it'll go again but all of the money you know the money going in that's, that gets the economy moving is being spent now on just holding it in a stationary position so yeah i think there's i think there's gonna be big disruptions i think it was the the, the boss of timpson the uh watch repair and key cutting chain said that the high street is going to look very very differently when things start getting back to normal there's going to be a lot of businesses which change now looking at this just just trying to be a little bit more positive for a moment because obviously what everything i've said is kind of a bit negative (laughs) (laughs) being honest it is isn't it um there's going to be some good opportunities here for for new businesses now if for example the high street there's going to be businesses that don't make it um i think debenhams has gone into administration again over this and i work um, for debenhams <laughs> is that well, true then or have i made that up debenhams has gone into administration yes fortunately our store where i am is safe but there's oh, okay. about 450 people who've lost their jobs in eight stores Ooh. but anyway the, the point i was trying to make is that if you know debenhams can't be the only one I, I, I refuse to accept they're the only one. Um, other stores will go into administration, which means there'll be a lot of retail premises suddenly freed up. And if they're suddenly freed up, the best way to get people in when, you know, there's, there's excess of retail space and a lack of people looking to rent retail space is to lower the price. So there are potentially new businesses here that could pick up a bargain on, on their rent. And that could be this, the seed that they need to get going properly. It might not be. But it is always it is a possible positive outcome. And I, I think it reflects what the, the boss of Timpson said in that we're going to see the high street be quite different after this. But we're just talking about the high street. But this applies across the economy. You know, office space is rented normally. There's going to be businesses that don't make it, which are based in offices. You know, the, the, there'll be an excess of office space, hopefully, in which case new businesses might find it's a little bit cheaper to rent offices. So there's going to be quite a shift as a result of this. And I think initially... It will be very negative, and there's a lot of people that are going to take a lot of pain from this. But, you know, the small, small silver lining, and obviously I know this doesn't mean anything to someone who's lost their job and their whole livelihood is gone or their business has been destroyed. But I think we are going to see some degree of positive change out of this, although it's not going to outweigh the negative. Do you have any favourite libertarian authors or thinkers? And if so, what's your favourite work? I quite like reading Daniel Hannan's books, if I'm honest. But also, uh, actually, Daniel Hannan and Douglas Carswell, I think they're they're relevant to the UK because obviously they're both UK politicians. And they they talk about real life examples with the real world, but they're also capable of talking in in abstract terms as well. So you obviously get to think about the, the point of the philosophy, but you also get to think about how it impacts in the real world and how it could be applied to make the world better. Mm. What's your journey been towards libertarianism? Has it been very much along the same lines or? 
Yeah, a long time ago, when I was at school, so we're, we're talking 20 years ago now, um, mm. I, I would have considered myself true blue. I would, would have supported the Conservative Party. I'd have been over the moon with Theresa May becoming Prime Minister back then. And as sort of time went on, my sort of viewpoint and my attitude has shifted. And I've, I've become sort of more worried about people's rights, people's freedoms and whatnot. You know, what drove me to the Conservative Party originally would have been its free market credentials, because I believe that's the best way to grow the economy. But then mm. this other side started taking over being more important or, or not being more important being equally as important protecting people's freedom of association freedom of religion freedom of speech they all play a part in that and sort of around 2014 2015 i sort of sat there thinking well my beliefs are not represented by any party there just isn't one mm. so i would actually looked at the electoral commission website how you form your own party because it's just like well there's nothing that represents my view and then i was looking at videos on youtube and i just happened to stumble across this guy called ron Paul and uh, it was a downward slope from there basically <laughs> uh, from there I found the Libertarian Party and from there I joined and yeah that's pretty much my journey um, so sort of slowly getting there but eventually you know having moment discovering Ron Paul and yeah that was it I was sold on the message it's quite interesting to think that most of the people who join the Libertarian Party don't just come from one area of politics they come from right over the spectrum so it's very interesting to listen to all of these these different stories. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I, I've, I know people that are, are very hard on the economic side of libertarianism, almost to the point of worrying less about things like freedom of religion and freedom of association. You know, it is something they're concerned about, but it's not like their driving issue. And, and for me, that they're all equally as important. So, you know, I, I follow, I, there's an organisation that you may have heard of called the BCA, the British Conservation Association. Mm. And their free market environmentalism. And I, I'm quite a strong supporter of what they do because it seems to me that you know, some people do get focused on, on one issue, but I think there's a very broad spectrum of, of policy points where libertarianism applies to it. And yeah, I think they're all pretty equal. But yeah, I, I'm not necessarily a majority. <laughs> Well, obviously, you're a representative of the Hampshire Libertarian Party. What do you think the prospects are for regional growth in your area over the next few years? I would say in some areas they're not good and in, in some areas they're very, very good. Um, so the area I live in, which is Basingstoke, there is a lot of people that are sort of on the libertarian wavelength and it actually applies to certain other parts of the county as well. So a couple of years ago, the BBC did a like a, a series of documentaries on why people voted to leave the EU and uh, they went to a place uh, in the north, I can't remember where it was, um, and they went to Southampton, which is obviously in Hampshire, essentially my patch. And in Southampton, they reported that people voted to leave the EU because they saw the benefits that trade was bringing to the city of Southampton because Southampton is one of the, the major trading ports on, on the south coast and they sort of wanted to see much more worldwide trade they wanted to see you know less tariffs less burden on goods coming in and and better flow of goods coming in from all over the world so those parts of Hampshire most definitely are very open to libertarian ideas because that's one of the sort of driving reasons that most libertarians were against staying in the EU because they wanted a much freer trade policy doing business with every nation in the world that wants to be friendly mm. so yeah I think there's some very good prospects in certain parts of the county there's other parts where it's, it, there's, a, there's a combination. So there's some parts of, of the county where most of the political leaders have not given the people that live there any aspiration. And they're sort of almost a little bit trapped from their own mentality. So that they, they've been sort of given this victim mentality. And they're now sort of, they sort of legitimately are victims, but victims of this mindset, which sort of keeps them trapped. And I think they're a little bit less open to it, if I'm honest. But, you know, it, we still have to go out there. and We still have to push a positive message about libertarianism. Do you see the party shifting towards more online activities in order to boost its engagement? So that, that's a very, very difficult question to answer. And that's because, you know, the party, in, in my opinion, one of the areas it lacks is people on the ground actually going out and talking to people, doing events or putting leaflets through people's door, standing for election, etc. That is, in my opinion, a, a weaker side of the party, which we do need to work on. We do need to make better. 
So to answer the question, it, we probably do need to do more online, but that's not at the expense of doing less sort of offline. We, we need to be doing more online because that's where people are spending their time at the moment. It's where people get exposure to new ideas. You know, you put a leaflet through the door, that's great. But essentially, you've only got the amount of time between um, it going from the door to the recycling bin to get your message across. So it's not a particularly effective way of doing it, but it it certainly is a way of reaching people that wouldn't engage with us necessarily online. So you see a lot of noise on Facebook and whatnot, but it isn't actually representative of the whole population. And and since the COVID-19 stuff has kicked off, you know, I've been keeping an eye on what's going on online. And I have to believe that what I see online is not a true reflection of the people across the country. Mm. And on that note, that is the end of this episode. It's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you for joining me, Scott. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'll be seeing you next time on The Libertarian Listener for yet more interviews. Thanks for listening. <laughs>